Before I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today. I'd like to acknowledge the land I'm on, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and extend that acknowledgement to all regions across Australia. I'd like to pay my respects to the Elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this country. Regarding the content today, the insight we'll be sharing comes from a survey, comes from survey results from over 230 IT executives across Australia that were taken over a two month period. They answered questions, questions surrounding the role of IT in digital and the role it played during COVID, focusing on a number of core areas. Comparing how we, how we will work post COVID-19 versus before, technology and digital success throughout COVID-19, hiring, hiring and resourcing intent, which job types will be, the, will be the top priority for investment? Technology and digital trends post COVID-19, as well as soft skills and demand. Why did we create this report? I don't think anyone could have predicted the year we're all gonna have in 2020. And with the landscape changing so often, it's been very hard to predict that what the market's going to do, the role technology and digital will play, let alone the impact that varying fortunes of individual states would have on the overall Australian economy. As a business across Michael Technology, we're always looking at ways to better partner with our clients and candidates and felt what better way to do that in 2020 than sharing insight into what the technology and digital community was thinking. Hence today's webinar and creating the technology sentiment report. Looking at internally at Michael Page, when looking at the impact that COVID has had across our business and the recruitment industry, it certainly looks like there's, been the be there's, there's, there's certainly been benefits of being in technology. Year to date reviewing our performance, our Michael Page technology business across Australia has been 52% less impacted versus the performance of our other disciplines, including finance, sales, marketing, supply chain, administration, engineering, and manufacturing, to name a few. Highlighting a couple of states, our micro-page technology business across Queensland is on track to have a record year in 2020 after a record year in 2019, which is absolutely an amazing result. While in Victoria, we're on track to surpass our year-on-year -year result for the second month in a row which is promising signs of things to come post heavy restrictions being lifted. Post today's webinar, all attendees will receive a copy of our technology sentiment report, as well as a graphic recording post this event. Moving across now to our agenda for, for this afternoon. We've just gone through the Michael Page Australia Technology Survey sentiment and the why. Moving forward, we'll then discuss the impact it's had across internal customers, the commercial impact, contracting, culture, leadership, and then a Q&A at the end. As John, as John mentioned, I'll certainly encourage all attendees to ask questions throughout the webinar, and we'll be reviewing that as, as we go along. So if there are specific questions that relate to a topic we are talking about, we'll more than likely stop um, throughout that slide to ask those questions as we talk to also specialists within the Michael Page technology team. But now moving across to our first slide across internal customers. On this slide, we'll be looking at the positive impact that technology has had on business over the last six months and what is to come. I think we can all acknowledge that all technology functions have had an enormous role to play in our transition from working in the office to working at home and then returning back, in particular across service delivery, cloud and security. To further elaborate on the role technology has played in enabling business in recent months, I'd like to introduce Anita O'Hara, manager of our Michael Page Technology Business in Victoria. Anita. Thank you, George. Today, I'm going to bring your attention to the stat that's currently on the screen. So as gathered from our survey, 82% of organisations agree that COVID-19 was the opportunity to showcase tech capability to their business. I think we can all certainly agree with this. COVID has shone light on the importance of the IT department and has been the solution for every organisation. Technology advancements that previously took months in the making happened overnight. With the transition to remote working, IT departments were inundated with demands while trying to cope with huge numbers of people working from home. Overall, organisations adapted quickly and IT had to act fast to enable people to work remotely. For us here at Michael Page, the example that springs to mind is Microsoft Teams. We successfully implemented Microsoft Teams back in January, February time once rolled out, we encourage people throughout the business to use, use it. Most chose not to. And luckily when COVID hit, we were forced, forced to use the technology we had access to, which was Microsoft Teams in this case. That was our go-to. And since then it has been part of our daily lives. 
So similar to every other organization, if you didn't have the technology in place, be it Microsoft Teams, WebEx, whatever the platform may have been, that had to be rolled out essentially overnight. I'm going to now bring your attention to another stat that isn't listed on the screen, but has come from our survey also. And that is that 93% of people surveyed agreed or strongly agreed that people that they feel more positive about their team's ability to work remotely. Whilst the pandemic forced every organization to remote working, it has proved how effective people can be working remotely. What organizations have realized is work happens wherever we are. And the aim of businesses is to ensure they're providing the tool sets to support this changing nature of work. A great example of this is Australia Post. Australia Post realized early in this pandemic that the changes forced upon the world of work in this time were going to become the new normal. They've worked closely with Cisco to re reimagine how workplaces will function as people return to work. Personally, I don't think we'll be waving goodbye to physical offices, but certainly we'll see much more of a blended approach. For us here at Michael Page in Melbourne, when we return to the office, we're giving up a third of our office space to cater for remote working. I think we'll see a lot more of this over the course of time and as we start to transition back into the office. I guess only time will tell this particular story. And now I'm going to pass you back on to George. Cheers, thanks, Senator. You've almost got away scot free there, but a question has popped up. So before we go into our next slide, I, I will uh, bring that to your attention. From from an infrastructure perspective, what job types have been most in demand throughout the pandemic? Yeah, good question. Um, but ultimately, look, technology has been less impacted than obviously other industries. And from an infrastructure perspective, Michael Page, we have seen a huge demand across um, infrastructure engineers and that isn't your traditional infrastructure engineers. What the demands from our clients have been is infrastructure engineers who do have experience with Office 365 migration skills and cloud experience, so be that Azure or AWS. So that has been the main bulk of the recruitment we have been doing across the infrastructure space since March. Now, with that, obviously, leads us down the path of cloud. And with, obviously, the huge component of cloud in today's market, every organization who are on a cloud journey, this accelerated um, the need to get that done quicker. And for those organizations who weren't embarking on a cloud journey, it certainly forced their hand down that route because this will allow and enable people to work better um, from home. So we've seen a massive shift and in focus into cloud technology, which ultimately will be the future of what infrastructure will look like in time to come. Jeez, no, thanks very much for that, Anita. Okay. Now moving across to the commercial implications for business. The top three trends that we've identified um, throughout the survey post COVID um, are there on the slide, digital readiness, data and automation, and e-commerce. Talking about e-commerce now in a bit more detail, within, internally within Page Group, we, we break down uh, e-commerce into two key sectors, retail and commercial services. As expected, with changing working and living conditions, the retail sector has seen a significant increase in online activity. This has been driven through advancement of buy now, pay later technology, technology and many organisations improving their click and collect capability. This is something the market has also certainly picked up on, with the ASX reporting significant increase in the valuation of e-commerce organisations since March. Interestingly, we've seen a number of our clients, rather than looking externally for talent across e-commerce, look at their internal capability, in particular across areas such as customer service, store management and merchandising. When looking at e-commerce across other industries, in particular across FMCG and manufacturing, there have been a trend of organisations rather than looking at investing in internal e-commerce capability, hiring e-commerce account managers to be the intermediary between organisations and marketplaces. To further talk about one of the key trends post COVID-19, data and automation, I now like to introduce Charlotte Weston, a senior consultant within our Michael Page technology team here in Victoria. Charlotte. Thank you, George. <clears throat> so yeah, over the last six months or so, we've seen a reduction in headcount across data and BI. Um, 
which obviously increased the workload with the teams uh, who are remaining. Not only did their workload double, but it actually tripled because a lot of the C-suite and exec level required a little bit more visibility across their data and across their numbers. Essentially, what uh, they realized was that they started, they needed to utilize their data better and, and the numbers and the information that they already had within the business, they needed to basically um, start using it. This, I guess, um, correlates with the stat that we have in terms of 26% uh, people would prioritize data uh, post-COVID. Uh, post On the flip side of that, though, unfortunately, we've seen um, teams of, say, like five or six people drop down to just one person looking after data BI reporting, which obviously is a, a lot of uh, work for just one person. That is generally if the managerial or C-suite level haven't necessarily seen too much value in their data or in the value that um, the team was providing that those insights. So again, on the flip side, yeah, that they didn't prioritize their data investment. So with industries that have grown and sustained throughout this period, such as healthcare, tech startups, or FMCG, or some FMCG, they've needed, um, well, they've been building up their data analytics platforms, essentially. So this required senior roles, such as head of data analytics or head of BI, or those hard to fill uh, technology roles. So data engineers with uh, core cloud core services experience or uh, machine learning engineers, which is a, a combination of a data engineer and a data scientist. Obviously, as you can imagine, this requires external assistance. Before I um, before you go in there, I'm probably going to preempt without even reading the Q and A, uh, Charlotte. Uh, machine learning engineer. It might be good just to maybe just highlight exactly what a machine learning engineer is and, and what type of backgrounds they come from and what they actually do in their their day to day role. Yeah, so that's actually a role that's popped up over the last two months. A few of my clients have um, brought it to the forefront. So typically, some of the responsibilities are similar to data engineers, building up those data pipelines, but also integrating the machine learning uh, work into workflows and systems. And then also with the data science kind of element to it, the training machine learning algorithms onto the platforms. So the tech stack, very, very similar to data engineers, but also with that machine learning element to it. So uh, platforms like TensorFlow. No, perfect, no, thank you. Um, and then regards to the automation, so, um, a lot of these organizations are on their data automation journey. So similar again to industry 4.0 in supply chain and logistics. The end goal is to streamline and automate processes. From a commercial standpoint, obviously automation is critical in driving productivity. Um, as the increase in demand um, builds, uh, obviously you need to uh, make sure that your workforce is, is working as well with it, which is obviously what George mentioned in the e-commerce example. Perfect. Thank you, Charlotte. Now, again, uh, you thought you could maybe get through this uh, unscathed without any questions, but a couple you know, have popped up. So before we let you go and we go into the culture slide, you know, what are the trends that you've seen over this year in regard to role job in terms of role types? So, yeah, so since I'd say since March onwards, um, similar to what I said uh, in regards to the visibility, we've seen that increase of reporting analysts. So people generally with, uh, or BI analysts, so people with uh, Power BI or Tableau experience. So basically people who can come in and provide a little bit more information and provide that uh, the insights back to the business. And um, this data engineers as well, but they they were at the beginning of last year, oh sorry, at the end of last year, all the way to the beginning of this year, and they've continued through. Essentially a lot of organizations realizing that they need to um, provide that foundation within their business and get their data structured properly before bringing in the data scientists to kind of create those predictive models and everything like that. But with regards to uh, cloud platform, AWS was the most popular end of last year and the beginning of this year, and it's actually now switched to Azure. Thanks, and there's a, another question here. Um, let's. During such an uncertain time, really curious to know if you've seen an investment in, in data governance as well. That's an interesting one. Um, so uh, yeah, towards the end of last year again, and the beginning of this year, everyone was talking about data governance. Um, 
that was li literally what everyone was was looking to implement and looking to bring people in with that uh, skill set. It was one of the first things that um, had its funding cut as data governance had little to no immediate ROI um, and it's actually a long game uh, process essentially. Unless you're organizations uh, who have to adhere to regulations, uh, not many people are investing in it at the moment. Um, but I feel like it will start to pick up again as it's one of those areas where it's a bit of a detriment to the business if you're not looking into it and you do need to address it. Hope you answered that question. Uh, geez, no, thanks, there's a, there's a few more questions popping up for you there. So I think we might just wait till the end um, and give you a bit of a break there and move on to the, to the cultural side of things. Thanks very much, Charlotte. Oh, sorry, going to the contracting side. So when we're looking at contracting, you know, when I actually look internally here from a Michael Page perspective and look at the trends of contracting within technology and the impact that's had across Page Group within Australia, year to date, 61% of Michael Page Technologies revenue um, comes from contracting. This is only temporary hiring, excluding fixed term contracts. Every, every state currently, currently sits above 50% contracting revenue. With no coincidence, Queensland, who are on track for a record year, um, having a whopping 85% of their revenue coming from contracting, which is significantly higher than WA, New South Wales and Victoria, who operate between 50 to 60%. With Queensland being less impacted by COVID, it'll be interesting to see if other states follow the same contracting trend as Queensland. Roles we've seen in highest demand during this period have been level one support. This has been a clear reaction as organisations look to enable their workforce remotely, infrastructure and front-end development. To further talk about the impact contracting has had on businesses in recent months, I'd now like to introduce Sean Golding, an Associate Director of our Michael Page Technology business in New South Wales. Sean. Thanks, George, and hi, everyone. As organisations look to navigate beyond COVID, an adaptable and flexible workforce is becoming that much more appealing. As you can see from the slide, hiring freezes and internal sign-offs for permanent recruitment has proved a little bit more impractical. 39% of our industry leaders from the survey believe that this demand within contracting engagement will continue, but in what capacity? We have two types of engagement that we see within the Australian market. One is your traditional casual rates, which are daily rate contractors within the technology space that offer those lucrative rates, uh, and the more uh, progressive arrangement, which is that fixed term engagement. What we found in the market over recent months is that businesses are starting to shift away from that traditional casual rate model where they can offer lucrative rates to employees and candidates to a more structured cost saving adjustment and a fixed term arrangement. Now, that's a very, very interesting time for employees and job seekers and a big decision for them to make moving forward. Without knowing what the, the, the future looks like in the uncertainty, they've got to make a decision. A lot of these roles that are being transitioned will give them a decision that they have to make. Do they look at the stability and benefits of a shorter term fixed term, a fixed term contract? Or do they continue to consider a shorter term monetary gain, which is offered in those daily rate contracts? Now, some of the challenges that that represents for companies is quite important. And I think that that will play heavily into 2021. Some of those challenges will be talent retention, talent acquisition, and subsequently project delivery. We hear a lot about cash flow, and those businesses that have strong cash flow as they navigate throughout this period will have line of sight of what their projects will look like and how they can deliver upon that moving into the new year. That being said, they will be in a position to attract and retain those, those candidates on a much better basis and offer those more lucrative rates, and they will be able to deliver projects and transformations faster, more efficiently. The businesses that don't have that line of sight will be the ones that struggle. And that's some of the information that we've seen in the market in recent months. But as I said before, this figure is, is not surprising as anybody that works within this landscape will know that contracting plays a big, big part in the Australian market and it will continue to do so. But in what shape will be the big question. Thanks, George. Cheers, thanks, mate. Um... We've had, a, we're, we've had a question pop up here. Have you got an example of any businesses that have shifted their focus from temporary to fixed term contracts and what's been the impact for that? Yeah, very good question, George. 
We've had a number of businesses that have started to transition away from that traditional casual model and we found it more so within that software development space. Um, we do have a business, you know, I won't, I won't name the organization, but an organization that we recruit heavily for in that software development space where we've onboarded a number of full stack developers over recent months. And in the last couple of months, the business to justify those costs or develop some sort of line of sight moving forward have had to consolidate and cut costs. So what they've started to do is offer a more fixed term arrangement to those contractors, which subsequently reduces the rate that they would be earning. As a result of that, we found that a lot of these contractors have actually finished up and exited the business. A lot of them are confident that they are still worth the money that they've previously earned and not willing to succumb to the new rates or, or the new structure that that business is looking to adopt. Again, time will tell if that continues in that manner, but we have seen a, a big transition, a big shift with a number of organizations. Thanks, mate. And, and just uh, one more question here. What other contracting trends are you seeing in the market at the moment? Well, that's a, that's a fairly broad question, but yeah, look, specific to technology and, and digital, that, that's really the way in which we're, we're seeing it move. It is specific to certain industries, however. If we look at the businesses that, that are performing a little bit better, we're, we're experiencing that more within the financial services space. So some of the big banks are, are, are the companies that are able to attract and retain that staff. A lot of the cash flow that they didn't think that they had six months ago that they provisioned has now been bought, brought back into the fore which provides them line of sight to continue to attract that talent from a contracting basis. But from an industry perspective, that's what will be very, very interesting moving into 2021 and which organizations will navigate best throughout this. Perfect, thanks mate. There's a few There's a few more there for you, but like the others, I'll give you a bit of respite before we come back to you uh, a bit later on, but thanks very much for that. Thanks, George. Uh, moving across the culture. On this slide, we're keen to explore the impact that technology and digital has had enabling organisations to create a collaborative culture, keep employees connected while also highlighting how important technology and digital has been creating a COVID safe environment. When talking to our clients, some of the key insight we've, we've learned over recent months is how important remote working has been to assist retaining talent as employees look to work remotely in other states or even overseas to be closer with family and friends as border close but also the impact COVID has had on agile working environments. For example, how will organisations hot desk in a post-COVID era? To further explore these topics, I'd now like to hand over to Martin Massif, Associate Director of a Michael Post Technology business in Victoria. Martin? Thanks, George. Um, and hi, everybody. Um, so I think yeah, this, this, this webinar comes at a particularly uh, point in time of year, um, as organisations now it, you know, are really looking at their approach um, to, to remote working uh, this year and that transition and how it went. And uh, particularly in Melbourne, looking at next year, this is an area we're particularly focusing on. Um, businesses are now developing new strategies across technology um, to identify areas of improvement, just to ensure that they have the capabilities to really digitally enable their workforce. Um, as George mentioned, um, COVID-19 has been a lot of employees you know, opting to attend home states or even countries to be their loved ones. Um, here at Page Group, for example, we've had people working not just from different states, but also New Zealand, India uh, and Europe during this period of time. Um, remote working interstate, uh, I guess now more than ever, has really given employ employers rather uh, more options to not only retain uh, their best talent and highly skilled employees, but also attract new ones. Uh, and that's a, a key point. So the true challenge uh, now comes where you know, the workplace is omnichannel uh, and in 2021, you know, distributed, co-located and remote teams will become norm, not just something for the big tech companies. Uh, and interestingly enough, um, this feeds into the stats you'll see on the screen around 30% of businesses being more open to hiring uh, an employee remotely rather than outsourcing. That's something you actually see to expect to grow next year um, to be significantly more than 30. Looking at it from a staff perspective, um, yeah, digital ready business um, really allows staff to feel more comfortable, um, but also to work as efficiently as possible um, without sacrificing productivity um, or collaboration. Um, but importantly, staff will expect that continued investment in a digital workplace by the employer, um, as well as developing new strategies uh, and keeping that proactive approach to ensure that all the is kept up to date um, from that perspective. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen from a business culture perspective how much technology has ensured employees can communicate uh, and stay connected um, in periods of isolation, 
as much as now we're not we're going out of this freedom of isolation, it's still providing the channel to support team culture and morale. So again, it comes as no real surprise that 70% of businesses um, ranked digital readiness as a top priority. Um, again, going to next year, I wouldn't be surprised if that increases even more. Um, interestingly enough, we work very closely with an advertising agency um, who advised us that some of the key search terms um, for new job applicants is working from home and work remotely um, when looking in Google. So this sentiment seems to be quite consistent, both from internal um, current employees and also prospective employers, uh, employees as well. Uh, and having said that, I think just to finish off, um, employees returning to physical offices and sites also want to feel confident about their safety so they can come back with more peace of mind. Perfect. Thanks, mate. I think uh, I think you've certainly hit a call with a few people here because uh, the questions are certainly lighting up. So I won't, I won't stitch you up with too many, but um, if businesses are slow or reluctant to continue investing in a more mod in, in more modern, digitally focused workplace, what pal what challenges do you think this will pose for their business? Yeah, that's a good question. It's quite a broad question, but um, I think you can look at this two folds. Um, firstly, from a um, a staff perspective, um, obviously a lot of what you do is speaking to candidates and clients, um, and from a candidate perspective, it's now the first conversation you're having. You know, what working from home capability they have. Um, what remote, you know, working do they have? Um, you know, it's, it's a number one topic on candidates' minds uh, and they want to know and have that confidence that they can have that, that flexibility of working. Um, and then to go to the client side of things, yeah, I've had a number of clients, particularly probably more so in the past month, two months here in Victoria, um, say this, they've actually lost talent they wouldn't normally lose um, purely because other businesses are offering remote working um, or more flexibility. So I think if businesses don't, focus on you know creating that sort of environment where they can keep their talent that will be a challenge moving on forward but I think make no mistake about it there are huge opportunities to be had by businesses um, you know it, it can add to you no know, commercial value um, from a kind of new lines of revenue um, the ability to generate ideas and, and business agility you know operational efficiency you know reducing operating costs lead times um, allowing teams to be more autonomous and self-organizing they're all huge plus points and then I think the employee experience, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, and the whole team collaboration side of things, if businesses do that right, businesses, uh, candidates and, and employees will want to stick around as well. No, cheers, thanks, man. Look, an in in interesting question here from Ian, because you, you've got quite in-depth experience when it comes to the experience side and the development design, but do CX inform technology decisions or do CIOs make decisions about the tech stack independently? Uh, what, what are you seeing, or what have you been seeing across the marketplace over the last six months? It's a good question. I think even prior to COVID, I think in particularly Australia was going for that period of time where you've got more of these service design or kind of business design related roles that are enforcing or having a large impact on wider business transformations. Uh, and obviously a lot of those business transformations are technology. That's something that certainly hasn't slowed down um, during this period of time. Um, and businesses have, if anything, accelerated some programs like, for example, some of the utilities businesses um, where they've had to work on uh, work on um, programs around um, obviously people having less earnings and, and less ability to pay their bills, like whole new streams of uh, like systems have been created to facilitate um, this change. So I think it's certainly, if anything, we'll probably see more of that next year, um, but it's, it's, it was a present before and that hasn't changed through this period of time. Perfect. Thanks, mate. No, thanks so much for your time. Very good insight. And moving across now to leadership. Yeah, I thought what a what a great slide to finish on. I think one of the one of the most compelling things that we actually found, you know, throughout this survey were the results of um, you know the soft skills and demand. And you know, from a personal perspective, having you know met with a large number of executives over the last six months and developing this survey, and over the last you know seven years, spending most of my career now um, heavily recruiting in the executive space, it's been incredible to see, in particular, over the last 12, 18 months, how important soft skills have become when ultimately taking these briefs and then working with my clients to ultimately find the best talent, you know, being a combination of experience and soft skills. And when looking at the top skill, top soft skills that, you know, are going to, that our uh, client surveys that were going to be in demand, you know, in order there, we had communication, autonomy, empathy, and adaptability. And I, you know, and, you know, point four there is probably one of the most important, um, you know, when looking at the last six to 12 months, when dealing with our people and, you know, being adaptable, being flexible, and that can be with people, or even commercial. Like I said at the start, no one could have really predicted the year we we're going to have in 2020, um, and things have been able to change very, very quickly. So that ability to be adaptable, both on the commercial strategic front, 
but on the people side um, has been absolutely paramount. And when you apply that, for example, with communication, um, you know, if we look at the current marketplace now, we've got more mediums now to communicate with each other than we probably ever have. You know, if I look at ways I can communicate with my team, I have Zoom, MS Teams, email, text, messenger. Um, and for those fortunately not, uh, uh, not in Victoria more recently, even in person over a coffee. Um, but ultimately being, being able to adapt our communication style to our people is absolutely, um, you know, it's absolutely critical. You know, some people you know, prefer that face-to-face -face interaction, whether it be over a video chat or, or Teams. Some people want to go for a walk and actually physically see people. Some people are more than happy with a blunt email, um, which is pretty direct that, that they can read and then get on with their work. But that ability to be adaptable in our communication style um, you know, is absolutely important to really help engagement with our staff as a leader as well. Um, point three you know, really strikes me as well, uh, empathy. Um, Again, looking at my own personal experience, but also talking to a lot of um, you know, leaders over the last six months, I think everyone, all of us have had different experiences over the last six or 12 months in different states with different economies, um, but also different backgrounds. Uh, you know, my personal experience is, um, when I look at it from a Victoria perspective, is I'm from Melbourne. Um, I, was born, I, I was born here. I'm for, very fortunate enough to have um, my parents and my brother and my siblings within a 5K radius. So my experience over the last six months is very different to that of my team. For example, if we go through the wide array and collective, you know, um, accents you've heard to, today, you know, a lot of my members of my team aren't from Melbourne, they aren't from Australia. So therefore they've had a very different experience during lockdown than myself. And when engaging with our people, having that empathy to really understand what is this one particular person going through at the moment? What has been their specific experience over the last six to 12 months? And how can I tailor my management style in line with how they're feeling um, you know, that's probably going to be, you know, probably has been and will be moving forward, absolutely critical in terms of driving engagement, um, you know, with our staff. And I think, like I said before, that there certainly can't be one size fits all approach when it comes to managing our people and when it comes to empathy as well. That last up point there, trust is one that's also, um, you know, popped up a lot, um, you know, over the last six to 12 months. And how do we actually gain trust with our people? And um, I think you know, checking in because you care or checking in because you want to see how, how, uh, how much work someone's done, to me it was a very, uh, a very interesting story that I, I, was, I, was, um, I was told by a client in the sense of they were talking me through how one call can have two completely different outcomes for an employee. You know, one outcome is we make a call to a client, we, we, we make a call to our, one of our employees, we check in to see how they're going, how they're feeling. We're adaptable with our communication style, we operate with empathy. We work with them, give them the autonomy. They finish that call feeling that they're cared about, that they're valued, that they have the autonomy to work, and that they have that they work for an organisation that's outcomes focused. On the flip side, we have a we have the same phone. We we have a phone call with another employee, have no empathy. We don't check in to see how they're feeling. All we talk about is numbers, etc. It's a short call. It's a disengagement call. We're not making eye contact. We seem distracted. Employee B finishes that phone call feeling not engaged, like they're not cared about, that they might be underperforming. And when it comes to the, the anxiety side of things, that only increases the stresses of the, of the job as well. And I found that a really interesting um, quote when I, was, when I was having that conversation with a client just the other week around the concept of just when we're checking in with the people, why are we actually checking in? You know, as leaders, we're all very busy, but when we're talking to our people, you know, why are we making that call and really having to think about what is the outcome we want to have out of this and, and what experience we want our employees to have with this interaction. Um, another point there, letting our leaders lead. Um, you know, again, a, a, great, a great conversation I had with another CIO just a few months back and I'm personally guilty of this and I think when we all kind of contemplate this, we're all a bit guilty of at times when things get um, get stressful when things um, get a bit hard, when things get difficult like now over the last six to 12 months with all of our experiences with COVID-19. As leaders at times, all we want to do is help. We want to roll up our sleeves and help our people and help our leaders as much as we can because we don't, we don't want anyone falling behind. We want to create an environment where people feel safe and they feel protected. At the same time, we promoted leaders and we've hired leaders to do, do a job for us. So sometimes the hardest thing is actually not rolling up our sleeves and getting involved, but actually empowering and giving our leaders the autonomy to do the job we've hired them to do or that we've promoted them to do. Because again, that experience for them, you know, especially over the last six or 12 months, this is just a great time to also give them the opportunity to thrive in, the, in their leadership roles, for a great opportunity for them 
to also develop their skills. And I think for a lot of us, um, that's, that is a trend that's very hard to break because we, we all try and be helpful where we can. But that, that notion of you know developing trust with our leaders and letting them lead in times that are quite difficult um, is one that I think we could all, you know, retrospectively um, really have a think about and moving forward, try and see if we can give our leaders more opportunities to do exactly that. I'm just seeing a few questions uh, pop up um, at the moment, so I'll just, go through some of these. Um, one question that's popped up um, regarding leadership we've got here is, as a leader, do you have any advice on how to instill trust um, within a team? Um, taking on that question, um, when it comes to instilling trust, I think that that needs to start, from, start with us as leaders. I, for me, if I was to personalise that experience um, over the last, in particular, six, six months in Victoria, um, I, I try to start to instill trust from a from a point of vulnerability. Um, so I, I try to take the try and jump on the front foot and actually share my own personal experiences, good, bad, or indifferent, around how I was feeling. Because I think, again, as a leader, I think at times we naturally default to in, when things get tough, trying to operate like we're bulletproof, like we're invincible, that we're the person that we you know that people need to come to talk to, and we have all the answers. And to an extent, that is the case, but. If we want to instill trust and, and vulnerability, we, we have to be able to show that level of vulnerability to our people as well and, and create that conversation where we're comfortable talking about how we're feeling and leading from the front. And if we do that, I think you find there's a natural flow and effect to that of the people around you as well. They'll feel more comfortable talking about how they're feeling, their vulnerability, and in doing so, that is a great place to start when it comes to instilling trust um, within, you, um, within your team. So to kind of revert back to, to the question, how would I you know, start in terms of you know, instilling trust? I, I would start by leading from the front and sharing some vulnerabilities. Um, going through Another question here. There's a question here just based on what are some of the events or some of the things culturally that organisations have been doing from our perspective to help drive culture over the last six months? Um, yeah, look, there's been you know, certainly a, a number of you know, fantastic things where, that we've heard and seen from our clients around how technology has been helped, you know, help keep teams together. And, you know, a lot of these things, you know, you all would have heard of in terms of we've, you know, everything from trivia nights to, to team drinks, to, to fundraising evenings, to, you know, watching live sport together. Um, you know, all of them have certainly been common themes that we've seen um, over the last six months. I know internally, you know, we, we've tried to also mix things up as, as well. We had just, uh, just last month the interactive and a lot of fun over, over MS Teams, we actually had a Master Chef challenge. So we actually had across our team um, a list of ten ingredients, and um, everyone on the team jumped on Teams, and we had to cook a dish up using five of those ingredients, and we voted on the winner, and then shared a team lunch together in the afternoon, and it had a great conversation. And um, I think that's been again the beauty of technology and digital over the last six months, is you know as we've seen throughout this presentation, it just isn't an enabler from a commercial perspective and revenue generating side of things and also um, the internal customer, it, it's now become this great connector of people internally and, and driving and creating um, you know, a great culture. Again, it was last Friday I caught up with my leadership team and we were sitting you know, in the park and we saw a number of people around us with their computers out on Zoom talking to their colleagues, having Thursday afternoon drinks and you know the, the circle next to us these days because everyone's got their 1.5 metre circles in Victoria. They were talking about how they just got to the, went to the park and across the road, their employee had organised um, a picnic hamper and a few drinks for them to pick up and then for the sit down in the afternoon, have an outdoor picnic and then as a group around Melbourne connect together over MS Teams and have a team catch up while all outside in their local areas engaging with each other. And it's things like that that just, they do lift you up a bit. That, you, know, I, I, you know, over the last six months, there've certainly been, you know, some difficult times and also some enjoyable times in our roles and there are tough conversations with candidates and clients. But for me personally, one of the most enjoyable parts of the role has been learning so much more about organisations and the efforts they've actually gone to, to actually bringing their people together and doing so using technology and digital. So go, team, so going across the Q&A here, we've got, we've got a few questions that have popped up. So um, I'll, I'll kind of read them out and put them to the group. Um, Sean, um, are organisations now more open to hiring offshore staff compared to onshore, given the fact that more staff are working remotely? Yeah, look, that's a good question. Labour arbitrage has 
been prevalent pre-COVID. A lot of organisations have been looking to move those services offshore at a cheaper cost, and I don't think that that will, will change. I think some businesses are really looking uh, beyond this and thinking what's more important, cost or service? So what we're experiencing is a lot of businesses assessing the service that they're getting from off offshore technology providers and how that is actually uh, supporting their business moving forward. But, but absolutely, there are organizations exploring that. They will continue to explore that uh, from a cost justification perspective. So to answer your question, yes, they are. And Earl, there's a few here around contracting, that's why I've got you. Uh, sure. Are contractors typically cheaper now with the change in the market? That's also a really good question. Um, look, so, yeah, yeah, I think the short answer is yes. I think businesses that have not moved to a, a four or a three day week, which is naturally a reduction uh, on their rates, there are organizations that are still offering contract engagements, but at a reduced cost. Now, the candidates that are in market that have bills to pay, fixed costs and, uh, and things of that nature, they have to consider that. Um, but certainly from my experience here in New South Wales and speaking to my counterparts in Queensland and Victoria, like yourself, George, yes, there has been a, a decrease. But again, it's specific to certain verticals. I think I've seen one question around um, project services uh, and program management, which continues to be prevalent. Uh, that seems to be heavily focused within the financial services space. We haven't seen as much of a change within that program space for, for you know, your standard project managers, business analysts, change managers, they still seem to be demanding the same amount. But in those more technical roles uh, across software development, DevOps, data science, and things of that nature, we have seen uh, a large disparity there. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out next year. Nice, and while I've got you, mate, and then maybe also to Anita, to both of you, there's a question here about with more people now working remotely and working from home, do you, do you, do you see this now lead to an acceleration of bring your own devices and a decline in the corporate fleet approach? I could pass that to Anita. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, um, from our perspective, certainly across Melbourne, you know, there has been a, a number of organisations who didn't have the fleet in play to enable and allow every individual to work from home. So certainly, I think um, from what I've experienced in the client engagement that I am having with clients across the Victorian landscape is the fact of the matter is typically IT could never work from home, they needed to be in the office, they have to be able to troubleshoot their issues, etc. COVID has certainly changed the perspective in, in terms of how we see IT now and what that will actually look like in the future. So um, I, I think going back to the question itself, you know, there is going to be a minority of organisations who will not change the way they operate, but any of the organisations who are going to be serious about their talent pool and retaining the staff that they have, um, they will have to jump on board this. And I do think any organisation I'm currently working with now and um, the expectations from candidates is flexible and dynamic working. So telling somebody that they've got to be in the office five days a week um, is going to be a massive barrier we are going to face throughout the recruitment process in 2020. And Sean, anything thinking... that you want to add? No, I think you've, you've nailed that, Anita. Um, you know, just to dovetail on that, yeah, I think the, the first thing that employers are talking about when they're discussing job opportunities with us is that flexibility, that working arrangement, the devices that they provide to work from home. But everybody seems to be talking about that. So it's really up to us to really uncover exactly uh, what else it is that they can offer moving forward. Um, nobody knows what the new norm will be. There, there's, I, I don't believe there's enough empirical evidence to support whether um, our, our technology professionals are more productive at home. Uh, we find that they're working later and later into the night, but then you have the risk of change fatigue. And what's that going to look like in another six months time? But businesses are being flexible, certainly from my experience, um, and they are offering that flexibility uh, to work from home uh, and work remotely. But again, we don't know what that will look like again in six months time if things return to the office. You know, cheers, Mark. And I think it's a, it's a really interesting point from you both. I think as we alluded to, on the cultural side, it's one answer I haven't actually, you know, um, I'd love to hear from people, you know, even post this webinar is, you know, clearly before COVID was the investment around the agile workplace and hot desking and people having, um, you know, having locker rooms. And if you have, you know, your property on a desk for more than two days, it gets cleared out because you need to sit somewhere almost every 48 hours. Clearly post COVID, that's going to be very, very hard to implement. So again, from an infrastructure service delivery, 
how are we going to how are organizations still going to encourage that agile working environment while still working within the parameters of a COVID safe environment i think that's going to be a very interesting case study to see um over the next six or 12 months we um you know with our clients and i think as i said before there's anyone out there you know, on the webinar today that's starting to go through that process or in other states that have actually gone through that i'd love to hear from you and understand it. um you know your mindset is how you're actually going to achieve that i do see that being a very interesting um you know piece of work to be to to to, to take on over the next you know certainly six months Martin, we've got a question here around digital readiness. Um, you know, it's rather a vague, it's rather vague term and overused, like digital transformation. You know, can we be a little, little bit more specific there when we talk about digital readiness? Yeah, and I, I, I completely agree with Andrew's sentiments as well. Um, you get a lot of these different terms thrown around, and, and most of the time they're pretty much talking about the same thing. But I think, yeah, you can put it legacy transformation um, as well. But I think. You know, you're looking at you know systems. Um, obviously, Nita mentioned earlier on around cloud infrastructure. Um, obviously, then that dovetails up across to you know, the relevant security integrations um, and I think from a directory perspective. But I think, you know, you, you can focus on that as one part. But I think it's the future systems as a second part. So you've got some of the bigger businesses, which again, I won't mention um, names, who are going through quite sizable um, technology transformation at the moment from like HR systems, payroll systems as well, which is completely changing, you know, quite the legacy um, systems, but systems they've used for, for you know, more than a decade. So. I think it's it's you're now seeing it across in other areas rather than just um but kind of the hands-on technology side of things um and the immediate kind of return to obviously being able to re re remotely work from home and those systems i think yeah we're now seeing it at a point where it's not just that it's more of the legacy systems um and the bigger businesses are using it as an advantage to do this now while they can uh, and also pick up some of the best talent because that's the cool interesting fun stuff that people also want to be involved in uh, from a candidate perspective so um it's a good opportune moment to get it done as well Perfect. No, thanks, mate. Um, and then Charlotte, have you seen many of your clients investing in automation talent during these times? Yes, essentially, like I spoke about um, before in this automation journey, there's a lot of organizations that are on that on that journey, essentially. Um, so yeah, bringing automation into the organization and making it essentially the new norm um, and automating processes, but getting rid of that I guess idea that it's to reduce workforce or get rid of people but actually it's to free up um that workforce and and let them spend time on things which actually they need to be doing and make them more productive as opposed to i guess just uh clicking a button to refresh a, a report but actually getting them to do something a little bit more um which yeah requires a little bit more to it but yeah oh cheers thank you and then Sean, just reverting back to yourself there, mate, on, on Christian's question. Um, just when it comes to project delivery versus software development, do you see project services candidates um, being more, you know, potentially being more open to um, transitioning from interim temp to FTCs, just like um, we've seen in the development space? Yeah, look, I think they're they're considering it, probably. Um, probably not the same as, as, as software developers. I mean, I think in the development space, they're, they're quite quick to say, no, no, that's not something that we'll consider uh, and we'll wait for that next best role. In the project services space, um, absolutely, it's something that will take into consideration. But the difference there is that a lot of these projects that are currently ongoing, uh, within that space, they're client facing roles. So they need to be there on the ground, boots on the ground, and they need to deliver. It's very different if it's a technical role that can be done remotely and it's sometimes more important for these organizations to, to complete these projects rather than start new ones so it's imperative for them to have the right talent in order to execute that but certainly the sentiment within that market is a little bit more open-minded but they've also got that um you know that that position or that ability to say no if they want to Perfect. No, thanks. Thanks, Matt. Look, I'm conscious of time. We do have a, a number of questions to go, but what we'll certainly do, you know, post this webinar is we'll respond back to all those questions. And as we, when we do um, follow up the webinar with the actual technology sentiment report and the graphic recording, we'll also respond back to those questions that we haven't answered um, throughout the session. So in terms of just, um, you know, wrapping up the webinar to everyone that's attended today, look, thanks very much. You know, hopefully you found the content relevant. You know, like we said earlier before earlier today the whole premise of the sentiment report and today's webinar was to share insight in terms of what your peer groups thinking out there and and hopefully you, you found it informative 
Um, you know, I post the webinar, we will send out the graphic recording, we'll send out um, a copy of the report, but at the same time, we'll also send the contact details of Anita, Charlotte, Sean um, as well. So if you have any follow-up questions specifically around any of the slides presented on today or specifically around their areas of specialisation, you can contact them directly for further insight as well. So to everyone again, thank you very much for, for attending to, to the panellists that helped me out today. You know, thank you for your contribution. Um, and to everyone again, I hope you have a good afternoon and a great weekend coming up.